few designers can claim a list of fans that includes Michelle Obama, Samantha Cameron, Melania Trump, and both duchesses. That's Cambridge and Sussex, Kate and Meg. But Roxanda Alinchich has dressed them all. The designer, originally from Belgrade in Serbia, has been a highlight of London Fashion Week since her 2005 debut. A master colorist, her shows are visual feasts every season. I'm Emily Cronin, senior fashion editor at The Telegraph and the founder of Fashion Unzipped. I'm delighted to bring you a special episode of the podcast here from Roxanda's studio, where we're surrounded by beautiful inspiration boards and images of past collections. Roxanda, thank you for having us. Can we start by hearing a little bit about the designs on the wall behind me? Well, first of all, welcome. Welcome to, to my special space, to little design studio that we are sitting now in. Yes, this is like almost like a hub of all of my ideas. I like to surround myself with everything that informed the collection from inspiration, past collections, as you noticed, which are also very close to me. Um, I usually like to involve my collection from my season to another. I don't like to my, to make radical changes. So I always like to see what was happening in the f- past while always looking in the future as well. So here behind you, you can see my next collection that is going to be presented in February and um, elements of, of it. We are working on it very, very hard at the moment. And um, and obviously my books, my inspirations, um, some of my twirls, the fabrics, I guess it's all condensed in this little space. I'm seeing towers of books, also some gorgeous sculptures and vessels on the walls around and booklets from museums like this is a a treasure trove of inspiration surely absolutely and particularly books are something that I'm very proud of Um, I kind of feel they're an endless source of inspiration and I can look through them over and over and over again and um, you know as you can see there are some kind of very old books here like for example this one called Wildflowers which um, is something that I'm kind of basing my collection on Um, so it's I've interviewed him yes oh man saying yeah it's absolutely amazing so it's it, it's just like from from many different um design disciplines you know there's uh, obviously artists photographers designers there is just like a craft man uh, craft books actually lots of marfa family magazines which i love as well and um yeah just just like many 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 different inspirations i always feel the richer the inspirations are uh, the more they come from many different sources and many different elements of our lifestyle, um, the better collection is going to be. Are you constantly seeking new sources of inspiration or is, or is it just what whatever crosses your path that then informs what you do? I guess it's a little bit of both. I always like to almost surprise myself by something that I discovered that I didn't expect. And usually those unexpected elements of inspiration are very, very important. I think they happen like almost some kind of outburst that that wasn't planned and feel very, very organic. But also there, there, there are artists, particularly female artists that inspire me a lot and architects um, and, uh, you know, writers too that I kind of like to kind of come back to over and over again. And particularly the big colorist that I'm, um, um, you know, always inspired with like uh, Helen Frankenthaler, Mark Rothko, uh, Jessica Stockholder, Philida Barlow. I mean, the list just goes on and on. So you've just alluded to so many points that I'm excited to discuss with you, but let's just slow down and back up to the beginning. Before you were in this studio in East London, of course, you were a child in Belgrade. And what's your earliest memory of fashion or or where did the interest come from? It goes really way back. I think I probably always wanted to be fashion designer without even realizing it because um, I always get that immense excitement and 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 pleasure when I was uh, doing something that was related to clothing. I think I always like to express myself through clothing. And I remember even when I was in a school that I used to customize my uniform, school uniform, and do little things that were not quite allowed at school, but I could just get away with. Um, There was always this kind of element of escapism, I would say, as well. You know, almost that you're kind of um, transforming yourself into somebody else or that you're transforming the world around you into something else that always felt more perfect, better, more desirable. And I 
actually think that's how everything started and it never really stopped. It just developed more and more and more through my teenage years and um, I just simply couldn't escape from not doing fashion, I think. But to me, that sounds like the profile of exactly the type of person who should go immediately to fashion school, but you didn't. No, I didn't. And and as I said, usually people ask me, what would you be if you're not fashion designer? And I said, well, actually, I try to be something else. And I still got back to being a fashion designer. And I'm going to explain this a little bit more. So coming back from Serbia, from Belgrade, um, you know, my amazing country that I'm so proud of, and, and I draw lots of inspiration from back home. But at the same time, it's it wasn't the place, or at least when I was growing up, that was particularly... Uh, lucrative for fashion designers. We had few big fashion houses that were quite kind of state um, run. And, you know, if if I could say a little bit more corporate than what would suit my taste and my expectations. So as a young startup company, young designer in Belgrade, you really didn't stand much of a chance to survive. So actually, there was not much need to for a fashion designers, independent fashion designers. And I realized that very early on. And that's why I started to study architecture, because I thought that that's a different, similar, but different form of self-expression. Again, very related to art, very related to design, a beautiful form of kind of transforming the cities and saying things not through clothing but through buildings but I couldn't escape fashion I at the same time cheekily enrolled myself to faculty of applied arts where I was um, you know studying fashion and very soon after I applied for masters at St. St. Martins and that's how I ended up in London. Yes you studied under Louise Wilson didn't you? Yes incredible Louise. What, what are some of your most vivid memories of of her as a person? Oh, she was just incredible. And I wish that there are more humans like her, tutors, teachers, but also friends, because um, she somehow became my friend almost immediately um, with her the things were pretty much kind of on the same level. Like, um, you know, she was very harsh. She always wanted better and uh, uh, more than, than what you thought you could give. And those were some of her kind of biggest strengths that she could very early spot a talent, spot a whole potential, but then also push you to to become almost like a better version of yourself in a way. And uh, that's what she did with me. That's what she did with many others. And I think that all of us alumni from St. Martin's and from her course that are now having our own labels are actually live examples of how incredible she was. I don't think it's, it's a coincidence that so many of us are now such important parts of London Fashion Week. For but, instance, you and, and... And Christopher Kane and Simone Rocha and Jonathan Saunders and uh, Matty Bowen and just list goes on and on. <laughs> yeah, of course. A lot of fashion students, when they when they finish a course, will go to work for someone else's brand. But I, you made the leap and started your own brand immediately, didn't you? Yes, not quite immediately. No, actually, I did. I did take a couple years out. And then I started a bit later. Okay. And why did you decide to take that leap? It must have seemed like a like a huge step at the time, but something you must have had the confidence to and the conviction to believe that it was the right choice. Yes, I, I definitely had I would call it like urge and this incredible desire to try things my own way, to express something, to say something to the world. I, I really felt that there is something so strong within me that just wants to be told and wants to exist. And, and I, I had to make it happen. And I just have to give it a try. I didn't really know if it's going to be success or a complete failure. And to be honest with you, I personally thought it's very likely going to be a failure. But there wasn't a choice for me. I just had to do it. The, the same way how I came here, the same way how I ended up doing fashion, it was just this thing inside of you that is kind of telling you, you have to do this, you have to do this. And that's how it all started. It's, um, you know, you, you get into business quite naive. You have many big ideas and many big dreams, but you don't know exactly what you are letting yourself into. And just when you are in that position, you realize how hard it is and all the elements that it takes. But it's a wonderful journey at the same time, and I would never change it for anything else. What was a breakthrough moment that happened early on for you? It's always hard to kind of pinpoint one 
breakthrough moment. There were quite few moments and I kind of feel they're still happening, incredible moments that um, you sometimes literally have to pinch yourself to realize if, if they are happening. But, um, for example, one of the big moments for me was when um, Michelle Obama decided to wear my dress on one of her most important state visits um, in just when they actually, during their first presidency, um, first term. And um, that was a very important visit from Chinese president when during the day she decided to wear my dress the entire day, which was incredible moment for me because at the time I was very, very young, unknown designer from London, certainly not known in, in America as much. And and then also, like, for example, opening my store was another moment that meant so much to me when I was able to express my world, not just through clothing, but also through the whole feel and the mood and, and the whole world of that wonderful store. And, um, you know, my friend David Ajay, a wonderful architect who who designed the store. And um, a, a, as I said, that there are like few moments that kind of happen all at a similar time that I guess create this big buzz and a big breakthrough. Am I right that 2020 will be the brand's 15th year? Uh, um, yes. Yes. Wow. Mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any plans for the 15th anniversary? I feel like it was just the brand's 10th anniversary, but... You know what? I feel just exactly the same like you, and therefore I'm not having any plans at the moment. I might change that, but the time is passing so quickly, and particularly in fashion time, I always feel that fashion ages four times quicker than anything else because we have four collections a year, so things are are, are happening in, in pretty fast speed. So, uh, yeah, it's a really, really exciting time, and I see maybe I will do something. You never know. Do you feel in fashion, I sometimes have this feeling that you're always living three months in the future, three to six months in the future? Yes, I think it's six months in six the future. I, I think it's very funny that even us in fashion get confused which uh, season we are working on, what are the fabrics, when are the things going to actually sell in a store? Because it's it's very interesting that now actually seeing as spring, summer and autumn, winter don't mean that much because it's more, you know, you have to think which month this collection will actually reach the stores and that's that's how you design. It's, um, it's, it's many changes that happen in the last 10 years, I think, in fashion. How do you resist that constant looking forward how do you resist taking that home? Like, like I know we're about to get to Christmas and, and in my head, Christmas has been done for months, right? Yes. So how do you sort of slow down and, and enjoy the part of life that you're in? That is, a, I would say, a huge skill that I'm still trying to master. And that luxury of time and being able to slow down, to reflect, to enjoy the moment it's something that I think it's it's a biggest goal, not just of mine, but of many of us that are living in London and in a fast cities and that are involved in a in a businesses like fashion that that are very, very fast. And particularly now with the social media and all information that is traveling and happening so fast, our private time is even smaller. And I think it is something that all of us have to work on. I don't think it should be take it for granted or just as something that should happen on its own. It's it's almost like a physical exercise. I think you have to set certain rules, be very strict with yourself and make sure to enjoy the time. And I can tell you, I'm still trying to master this. I still didn't manage to get to that point that I'm feeling happy and content that I'm really enjoying that moment, but um, I'm determined to to do it soon. How do you use social media personally? Well, I use it in many ways. I think social media have been incredible, you know, very, very positive in some ways and very negative in others. And I think just to kind of create that balance, it's very important. So, you know, to look more at the positive side, like, for example, I, I'm also like all the visual people really um, drawn to visual things. So, uh, you know, following what is happening on social media, looking at ideas, at images, um, being able to kind of follow my friends, my colleagues, what is happening in the industry on literally minute basis. It's, it's, it's really, really, really exciting for me. You almost don't have to go and look for information. Information is coming to you 
on its own. <laughs> so those are all good things. But then, as I said, one of the negative is is just the time and um, and just the abundance of information that comes and and kind of necessity to filter it and to kind of see what is good and what is maybe less important. Has Instagram influenced in a way that you notice the way that you design or the way that you present your collections? Um, maybe not so much. I, w- I would I would call myself, you know, still kind of old school that maybe it's not reliant on Instagram as much. So I always love to kind of uh, present things in a beautiful way. So Instagram became just another of my tools when I could say and express my world and project things that are necessarily not so visible, like, for example, what's happening backstage or what is happening in in my private life. But I am a very private person and don't feel necessarily as comfortable sharing all this information nonstop all the time. Um, So, yes, I, I wouldn't say that Instagram has changed the way I design immensely. Well, let me tell you, your collections always look fabulous on Instagram because of the (laughs) incredible colors and settings. I mean, you are, you do have such a wonderful way with color and from the clothes themselves to kind of the persimmon colored runway that that you showed them on in September at the Serpentine. It it was sort of orangey yellow, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. Where does your sense of color come from and what color combinations are you drawn to now? I don't want to say them, but you can if you want. Yes, that those have to stay secret. We're in okay. a very secret Fine. zone. <laughs> we're in a secret of the zone. future. Yeah, we're, we're like living six months ahead. Well, not six now. It's only like a two two months ahead. But uh, yes, uh, well, color. I think that love of color and confidence, how to play with color. I think I'm bringing from back home. I come from a country that has very strong summers, very long summer springs. Everything is determined by that um, incredible sunshine that brings that extra pop of colors everywhere. And I think I grew up with it and I felt very, very confident when I came here to use it. And above all, I missed it. You know, I felt that there is piece of my childhood or or piece of my, um, you know, elements from back home that I love that are missing here. And I just kind of wanted to bring them back and wanted to show people here as well where I'm from. And that connection with Belgrade, with my country, but taken through kind of almost like a London lens, because obviously I've been living here, I've been experiencing things through very creative London um, kind of eye as well. And I think that that mixture of both is really what kind of created me as a person and as a designer. We've talked about some of your references and that you studied architecture, the fact that you show at the Serpentine. You really, to me, are a designer who really blurs the boundaries between creative pursuits. Uh, And I know that you recently designed a flat with the furniture art, every aspect of the decor. And naturally it made a perfect backdrop for your clothes as well. So how does interior design relate to your fashion design? And and do you think that that could be another area of your practice in the future? Maybe never say never. Actually, I enjoyed that project so much um, and actually much more than I even thought I would. I took it as a very, very exciting challenge. And I'm a person that loves to collaborate. And as you said, I like to kind of blur boundaries between different artistic disciplines. And I always felt that, you know, we are all kind of starting to design from certain feelings, certain emotion, and the principle of designs are very similar. But then obviously what we create is very different and and I always wanted to try and merge all of those disciplines together. So actually to to branch into interiors was a very natural process for me, particularly because I studied architecture. Although I must say, when you study architecture, you don't necessarily study interior designs. They're, again, completely two different disciplines, but, you know, with similarities, obviously. And what I did, I just, all the principles that I'm using in my own creations with, with my own garments and in my own brand, like color blocking, uh, champion championing women, using certain easiness, effortless feel when you wear my dresses. I wanted to use all those same elements in in apartment that I curated. And I think that you can see all of that. I think that people have reacted in such a positive way. So, so basically, I approach 
uh, creating and curating the apartment exactly the same way as my designs. And I think that that freedom in expression, you can really see it and you can link both categories to each other. And and I love how you can see my dresses almost living in that apartment. And whoever came in thought that I'm already a resident and that I've been living there for quite some time. And I think that feel of feeling sheltered and protected that you could feel in that apartment, you feel exactly the same when you wear my dresses. And that was such a huge compliment for me to hear those words from people who visited the apartment. So you alluded to effortlessness and protection yes. in your in your clothes, which to me perfectly explains why a who's who of powerful women have chosen to wear your designs. Is there anyone who you've been particularly excited to see wearing your clothes besides Michelle Obama, who would have to be everyone's top answer. <laughs> I, and this is not, honestly, this is not just diplomatic answer. I honestly feel like this, but I can't pinpoint only one person. I just think I've been really blessed and lucky to see all those inspirational women that are coming from many different backgrounds, many different countries with w- many different beliefs, all wearing my dresses. And, and I think that that more unity and community of different women still gravitating towards my dresses, feeling um, incredible and choosing to wear them in very, very important moments in their life. I think that that community is something that makes me very proud. And I think I I would probably pinpoint that as a highlight. Of course, you wear your clothes incredibly well. Um, I remember one time that that I saw you not so long ago, we were getting off the Eurostar in, in Paris. And everyone else is kind of slumping off with their luggage for Fashion Week. And you're like, like you like stepped off the train and the steam kind of billowed and it was very cinematic. And you had like a long <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> um, tonal red outfit and kindly directed me to the taxis. And it was like, it was like, I feel like I've just been conveyed by a fa- fashion fairy godmother here. Uh, um, <laughs> Well, how do you feel when you when you wear your own clothes, knowing that you design them and that you've created them for this community of women, but also effectively for yourself? I think it's very important that you really believe in your designs. And I always say this, you know, when people ask me, are you de- creating clothes for yourself? Of course, I'm not because I wouldn't have the brand if I'm just creating clothes for myself. But it would be a small this, brand. It would be very small brand and for very, very tall people. But <laughs> I must say, you do have to believe in everything that you are doing. And I think that genuine love and belief in what you are creating has to be there. You can never, ever let it go. And the moment when you start to design just for sake of it or to meet certain numbers or to please somebody else, I think as a designer, you're lost. And I think that you can't fool the customer. You, the customer, the final customer or the fashion editor, they can feel it. I think that that is what makes clothes different than a fashion. You know, when you create fashion, people can feel if it's genuine and if it's coming from from the heart. And that's why I kind of feel I believe in each one of my designs. And some of them are not right for my body shape. Um, some of them don't necessarily look amazing on me, but I still love them equally the same. And, um, you know, I, I will never lose that as long as I design. Hello, I'm Marianne Jones, and I'm the editor of The Telegraph magazine, which means I spend my week overseeing every page, from the front cover to hard-hitting news reports, columns and lifestyle features. We go to print weekly, so we have a little bit longer to craft our journalism, using our award-winning writers and fantastic art and photography teams. That means we can publish long-form pieces that really get to the heart of the story. Just recently, our cover interviews with Joaquin Phoenix and James Middleton made global headlines, while our writer Mick Brown's investigation into false memory syndrome won a major press award. And the fact of the matter is, we couldn't have done all of this without our subscribers. Without them, we just can't commission the stories you like reading or make podcasts like this one. Why not try out a 30-day subscription to The Telegraph completely free? Go to thetelegraph.co.uk slash audio. Which other designers do you wear or 
who working in London now do you do you admire and and try to support? Wow, there is there is quite a lot of designers that I um, love and admire. There is lots of female designers now that uh, when I started, sadly, there were not many. Actually, I think that I'm probably one of the first um, of you know generation when I started. Um, you know, and I, I was. Um, the only mo- woman amongst few few men who are all very very good friends, and I'm very proud to kind of call them my friends. But you know, I love this whole uh, kind of new wave of of confident women designing, and there's so many in London. Like you know, I mentioned earlier Simone. There is also Molly Goddard. There there is uh, Regina. Um, oh my God, so so many now. I'm suddenly thinking about men as well, which I want to mention too, like Matty as well, art school, um, you know, so many, so many really. Um, and I I love wearing them, like Christopher Kane, Erdem are, you know, very good friends um, who designs our love and respect so much and um, feel great when I wear them as well. So it's, it's, it's another actually lovely thing to say, which is like talking about community and talking about actually uh, that here in London, we really are a community and support each other. And um, it's something that, again, London should be very, very proud of, I think. And it's a small community. Didn't Regina work, in, yes, work Regina with you was working, at the beginning of yes, her career? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And for example, somebody also like Lulu Kennedy is such a incredible support of young people. And, you know, the Fashion East is, is a, another incredible organization that is supporting young designers. And I was lucky enough to be supported. But for example, all the Fashion East designers as well are just as exciting as a kind of new young bloods coming through. Is there like a London designers WhatsApp group? I mean, do you guys help each other with uh, with questions about work and suppliers and everything or is it more ad hoc more more individual than that there's definitely not the whatsapp <laughs> I, I don't think that would quite work um but it's it's definitely interesting idea i think it's it's quite organic and it quite kind of happens spontaneously um and i think it's um also like many people that are already in the industry that are kind of trying to kind of connect us together so yes it's 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 a lovely thing to be part of and speaking of the next generation your daughter and her class were had their own front row at your last show which was just one of the most charming sights of of all of london fashion week how interested in or how aware of what you do do you think your daughter is and or is she just terribly unimpressed by the whole thing and it's like gosh mom another show no, no, on the contrary. She's very, very aware. Um, she's been part of my shows even when she was a little baby, when, you know, we had to put uh, like a headphones on her ears because the music was too uh, too loud. And, uh, you know, she was, she almost grew up here in my studio. She's usually coming here before uh, the show days when we do fittings. She's usually here when we are doing the photo shoots. She's, she's really, uh, um, you know, intrigued by it. She loves Loves it so far. I'm sure this will change eventually, and I'm sure that she will go through some kind of period of rebellion and and not liking what her parents are doing, as we kind of all did at at, at a certain age. But I I really feel that for young generations is is very important to to show them things that are beautiful, to show them things that are inspirational, just to open their eyes. And it doesn't matter if they're going to do that necessarily in the future or not. But I think that she is in a certain privileged position to be able to experience all of this. And I think it's it's my duty as her mom to use that opportunity and to show her the best things that are coming from my work. And yes, it was definitely one of my highlights in my career that show when I had her and her whole class uh, watching the show and also being able to enjoy it because they came before when they were much younger and maybe didn't experience experience the show in the same way but I think that this time as being slightly older and more mature they loved it so much and um, you know you could see it in their eyes and smiles how excited they were to be there and I think it's just my actually privilege to have them at the show. It's lovely that you can extend that to her whole class and have them all there. Does she ever give you styling feedback? 
Oh God, always. And very interestingly, she's she's always right. Like it's it's you know you can't fool child's eye. You know she would make very funny comments. I mean now I can't quite specifically remember which one, but they are really really funny um, and uh, very blunt. <laughs> Does she ever comment there on what no you filter. wear? Yes, yes. So there is no filter. You know if if I if she feels that I'm looking good, she would certainly say that. But if she feels that I'm not looking good or that something does doesn't suit me she would definitely be the first one to say it and it's it's yeah it's it's wonderful i have a, a nearly six-year-old daughter who i think has like an encyclopedic memory of everything in my wardrobe and sometimes i'll come downstairs and she'll say mommy is that a new skirt <laughs> it's, it's like, Shh, stop keeping track along with the flat that you designed you also have a a great new collaboration with lululemon roxanda's first activewear some of the boldest, best-looking activewear you've ever seen. Thank you. <laughs> um, is there an area of design or a specific project that you're keen to explore next? Wow, that this is a very good question. I did so many projects so far, and I keep to surprise myself at, at the projects that sometimes I decide to do or come my way. Uh, Lululemon was one of them, and I enjoyed it so much. I, I don't know. I, I have to properly think about that question, but I'm sure that will be something that once that you see, you will probably think, wow, I couldn't have thought of that. But look, here she is. Here she's done it. I, I think possibly actually some artist project, very, very interesting artist project would be super exciting too. Or curating an exhibition, I think yes. would be very natural for you. That would be very natural for sure. Yes. Great. So just a few last quick questions. So what is a song that you can't get out of your head lately? Kate Bush, This Woman's World. What was the last film you saw? <laughs> Sorry, oh, this is really it's okay. funny. <laughs> no, because I do see lots of movies that are all with my daughter. So I'm just thinking, oh, yes. Frozen 2. No, no, it's it was a Christmas Carol, but the original version, you know, the black and white that is painted. Um, so that's the one that I saw, Christmas Carol. And what's the last thing you bought that you love? Let me think, let me think. There must be something. Oh, my God, what did I buy that I love? I bought a Grayson Perry's yoga mat, which I love. <laughs> I haven't seen that. <laughs> it's really funny. It's really funny. What What's on it? <laughs> It's a woman that she's, I guess, the, the yoga uh, guru. And she has like a different uh, things written on the top of her body, like what she needs to do, how should she do it, where she needs to do it. It's quite ironic and it's very critical of our society and women practicing yoga and Pilates. And um, yes, I, I, I thought it's a wonderful thing to have when I do my Pilates lesson. <laughs> A little, a little wink. Yes. If you could snap your fingers and be anywhere in the world right now, where would you go? I would probably go to Montenegro. I love Montenegro and, and it's kind of linked to so many wonderful memories. That's usually the place that I would go as a child uh, to the seaside. So I guess I would probably be there somewhere around Sveti Stefan. And then what do you have far too many of in your wardrobe? I definitely have far too many of everything. My wardrobe is exploding. It has so much clothing. But then on the other hand, there is never enough dresses for a woman, is it? And, and, a, and a, you know, outfits and a shoes. I think I love wearing my things over and over again and, and things that I love. So, yes, may, maybe maybe my wardrobe is just fine. <laughs> I that just seems, need the biggest space. That seems like a great place to end. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you. A pleasure. That's all we have time for. Thanks again for joining us. As you probably know, the podcast is taking a little break in the new year, but I would love to hear from you. So please let me know what you think by sending comments, critiques, and feedback to unzipped at telegraph.co.uk or find me on Instagram at Emily Crow. That's Emily C-R-O. 
And of course, you can visit telegraph.co.uk slash fashion unzipped sub for a free 30 day trial of all of our online content, including plenty of other designer interviews and roundups of the decade. Thanks for listening and have a wonderful new year. Hello, podcast listeners. My name's Danny Boyle, and I'm The Telegraph's Commuter Editions Editor, which means it's my job to provide you with great journalism that makes your journey to and from work as enjoyable as possible. I can't prevent train delays or guarantee you won't get caught in the rain, but I can make sure you're up to date with the best of The Telegraph every morning and evening. My colleague Chris Price and I produce briefings to bring you up to speed in just two minutes at both ends of the day. Now, they're also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Just search The Briefing or follow the link in the show notes to this episode.